But Paul has already recognized he will not be a beneficiary of that work of the Lord in his life to transform him to become like Christ if he does not faithfully continue pressing on toward the upward calling and the goal of, that Christ Jesus has laid before him. And if he wouldn't achieve it, unless he presses on, unless he perseveres, how much more us? Let's read and study Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. The Holy Spirit says to us, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. When I look at this particular chapter, one of the things I look at is the things I can rejoice in. I mean, that's really one of the places I start. But that's not the place I finish. That's not where I stop. So do I rejoice in the fact that my citizenship is in heaven? Absolutely. Do I rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? No question. Do I rejoice in the power of Jesus to transform me from this body of corruption and give me a heavenly body in which I can dwell that will no longer be subject to sickness and pain and death and suffering? Absolutely. Do I also rejoice in the fellowship that I have with other men and women who do love the Lord, not just in word, but in word and deed? and demonstrate daily by their lives that this is who they are, no question. 
What a great and wonderful blessing that is. But I don't ignore the other things that he says. I don't simply move on from there as if that's the entirety of the message here from chapter 3 in 1 Philippians. He starts by telling us in the very beginning that it's not tedious for me to write the same things for you. And in our New King James translation, it says, but for you, it is safe. He's obviously repeating himself. They've heard this before. But he's saying it again. It may be again and again and again. Why would you tell somebody who is walking faithfully with Christ to be careful to make sure they continue to do so? There's only one reason to tell them that. Because there's the potential that they would stop abiding in Christ and the consequences for not abiding in Christ are dire. That's why. Because they're real. So much so that when we read, but for you it is safe, unless you look up what that means, you probably don't have any idea. Unless you pause for a minute, unless you approach the word of God looking for him to tell you something and teach you something rather than arriving and saying, well, heck, I'm already safe because I already pledged my allegiance to the Lord. I already was baptized. I already prayed the prayer. Here the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm going to remind you of these things because to do so helps you remain secure. That's what he means by safe. It's for your protection. If there was nothing to protect you from, this would be absolutely absurd and frivolous. God is not that way. So there must be something to protect even these faithful Philippian Christians from. What is it to protect them from? Beware of dogs. He's not talking about four-footed animals. Dogs in this case are people of impure minds. Unholy minds, people whose minds have no problem with walking in sin and then potentially corrupting the minds of these faithful Philippians to do likewise. That's what he's talking about when he says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. People doing evil things are evil workers. Jesus says, workers of iniquity in other places. Why should we beware of them? Because bad company corrupts good character. How do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit tells us that. And what we will do, if we're not careful, is we will start allowing the impure minds of the people he's referring to of the, as the dogs or the impure actions of the evil workers to get us to compromise in our lives our faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We won't take seriously the gift that he's given to us, and we won't hold it in highest esteem to make sure that we, A, are glorifying God in our lives first and foremost, and B, we're giving the greatest benefit to these people by making sure we don't compromise at any level for any reason for anyone so that they can see the light and hopefully be drawn to it, and they too would learn to abide in Christ for the salvation of their own lives. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the circumcision. The circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the spirit, of the heart, we have cut away all of the lust of the flesh and we have crucified the old man and we are now most interested in walking in the spirit to glorify our father in heaven and to be a benefit to others so that they too can have their lives saved. That's how we worship the Lord in spirit and truth. That's how we demonstrate we are in fact rejoicing in Christ Jesus. It is not just a party we go have. It's not just because we have unabashed emotional outbursts about how grateful we are for what Jesus did. To rejoice in Christ Jesus is to live in such a way. 
And to have no confidence in the flesh means we're not going to come up with any excuse. We're not going to think that we are a certain way and that gives us permission to live the way we want. We're not going to do what's right in our own eyes. We're not going to live according to the lust of our flesh. We are going to account the flesh as nothing and have no confidence in it. So it won't matter how many degrees someone has. What matters is, are they listening to, learning from, and following the Lord for demonstrating their faithfulness to Christ? For providing the greatest benefit to anyone they interact with? Is that what's happening or not? He goes on to talk about his pedigree which we don't need to go over again. Essentially, this would be the guy saying, hey, look, I was born into a situation where uh, I rose to the very top of my trade. I have the dozen PhDs in divinity and all the related sources. And I count all that, he says, as rubbish. The word rubbish is also excrement. That's what he counts it as. What's he count it as rubbish for? He says, but what, the, what things were gained to me, those things gave me in the eyes of the world and the eyes of people who were walking according to the flesh, gave me popularity, gave me notoriety, gave me position, gave me money, gave me what I thought was security, gave me a group of people that liked me, that I felt comfortable with. He's saying, but what things were gained to me these I have counted loss for Christ. You may be in a situation somewhere in your life. It may be your immediate family, your extended family, your job. You're in prison among other inmates. You're in a community that is mostly anti-Christ. All of those things of standing he's talking about counted all loss. In other words, Give them away. Reject those things for Christ. How would you do that? By being faithful to him, to come to him, listen to him, learn from him, and do what he wants you to do. Trusting in Christ, not yourself, or the circumstances. Faithful to Christ, not yourself, and not the other people, and certainly not the world. He says, yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. This term excellence of the knowledge of Christ, he says, that's the greatest thing. That's what the, per the word excellence is trying to communicate there. It's the best thing of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Understand, he says, of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Not just some historical figure that we can talk about that did things. But a change of life for him where he had other lords in his life. And now he has one, the Lord Jesus. His master, to whom he comes for all of his training and instructions. From which come his training and instructions, which he fully and wholeheartedly embraces as the most excellent thing that he can know and have and the most excellent person he can listen to and serve. Everything else he counts as excrement or rubbish. And listen to what he says next. He says, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. It's one or the other. You can't blend them together. There is no just asking Jesus in my heart to become part of my life. He's never offered that and he never will. What he offered for you to do is die, die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. That you could be his. He had no intention of ever blending with all the other mixed up stuff that's in your mind and in your heart. What he wants to do is wash that clean. And if you will, in fact, humble yourself 
and have the mind in you that is in Christ, you will humble yourself and realize that no matter how old I am, whether I'm 10 or I'm 90, for me to come to Christ means to come, I, I come humble. I come ready to listen, ready to learn. I don't have my, the hair on my neck standing up looking to see who I can stand up against. I'm not easily offended. I'm not taken back when the Lord says, I'm immature, I'm wrong, I'm in sin, I need to change, I need to learn, I need to discover, I don't understand. I want to hear those things from him when those are true because he's the Lord Jesus Christ. He can teach me righteously. He can teach me truth. He can help me understand. He can develop in me the mind of truth and justice and love and compassion and faithfulness if I will be humble before him. And he then can use me as an instrument in his hands to go out and be a benefit to other people. And he says that I may gain Christ. People say, well, that sounds like works now. That was the invitation Jesus gave to us to come and surrender ourselves to him that he would, by his Holy Spirit, pick us up and put us in Christ, giving us new life in Christ. That's not works of mine. That's works of his. What must I do? Humble myself and surrender. I have to put all that off. In another place, the Lord has said, those who are Christ's have crucified the lusts of their flesh with its passions and desires. That's what he says. So for me and for anyone else, what he says here is, in order to gain Christ, we have to put that all behind. We have to count it all as rubbish. That's the same thing as reckoning it dead, reckoning the old man dead. He says, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Not what he's doing by keeping the rituals, but that which is a gift of God, which is faith and grace. And then they take that faith and apply it to the grace of God and know that that gift of grace is unto salvation as I faithfully abide in Christ. I now are gonna, am going to learn a new way to live as I listen to him, learn from him, and follow him. And I delight in that way of learn because he's rescued me from a place that I was unrescuable but for what he's done. I could not do the works of the law or any other works I can invent ever work my way out of it. I had to be rescued. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Notice he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That only happens by abiding in him faithfully. When we are first rescued, it is accounted to us as righteousness, and our belief is accounted to us as faith. But now, still breathing and able, we now must walk by faith and not by sight. We must come to him, listen to him, learn from him, and abide in him faithfully. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. This does not sound like any mixing and mingling of that old life with his new person at all. That I may have the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death, death of the flesh. This is what we all must go through if we are going to be his. And we must diligently maintain this perspective in this place not allowing our flesh to rear back up, starve that flesh and feed on the spirit. That we would also experience some of the sufferings he experienced. He tells us that will happen. Not it might happen, it will happen. And we need to go, be willing to go all the way 
to be conformed to his death. Whatever's in us that's not holy and righteous before our Father in heaven must be put aside, must be put to death, must be canceled in deference for the truth as shown to us by Jesus Christ. He says, the very next thing that he says, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Here the Apostle Paul is saying, I don't have it guaranteed to me. What's not guaranteed to him? The resurrection from the dead. He says, if I may attain or achieve the resurrection of the dead. What is he openly admitting? I must continue to be faithful if I'm going to achieve it. I must continue to abide in Christ, just like you. I must work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, as he said in the previous chapter. I must have the mind of Christ in me. I must grow in wisdom, knowledge, grace, and favor with the Lord by attending to my relationship with him and feeding on his word so that I can abide in him faithfully and closely. He repeats it. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. He says, look, I'm not guaranteed. You know me. You know my faithfulness. But even I am not guaranteed. I must remain so. I must tend to my relationship with God. If I'm going to succeed. If I'm ever going to be perfected by Christ Jesus my Lord in him Ultimately and finally, he says, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. When we're first born of the spirit, Christ lays hold of us. The Holy Spirit places us in Christ. He now has laid hold of us. But he understands, Paul, the great teacher of the word of God by the Holy Spirit tells us that even he must press on. That means strive for running the race well. So that, he says, I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. You know why Christ has laid hold of us? To rescue us permanently and eternally. Paul is saying that I may lay hold of that permanence, that eternality in Christ by being faithful to him. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, in other words, to have already achieved, to already possess it and it can't get away from me. No, 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 he says. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, follow my example. Verse 17. He's, first, he says, look, of those of you who are mature, in verse 15, you already understand this. Those of you who don't understand this, God will reveal this to you. If you come to him, listen to him, learn from him, he will reveal this to you. He won't force it on you. Nevertheless, verse 16, to the degree you have already attained, let us walk. In other words, however you think you are in Christ, young or mature, then there's how you should be walking. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. What is that same mindedness? Commitment to our Father in heaven to always be about his business, always be glorifying him, always be learning and be pleasing in his sight. Verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. He's not embarrassed or arrogant in saying, you've seen my example, now follow it. And those like me, watch them. There are more of us. Pay attention. Watch and learn and follow. That's a good group to be in. Not because other people will like you, but because you'll be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. He then warns them of people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction. That word for destruction has to do with essentially given over to eternal damnation. Whose God is their belly and their glory is their shame. The thing that shines most in their life is their shameful thinking and conduct. Disregarding the truth of the word of the Lord. Who set their mind on earthly things. He reminds us again for our citizenship is in heaven. 
from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. Look, that's a great thing. But Paul has already recognized he will not be a beneficiary of that work of the Lord in his life to transform him to become like Christ if he does not faithfully continue pressing on toward the upward calling and the goal of, that Christ Jesus has laid before him. And if he wouldn't achieve it unless he presses on, unless he perseveres, how much more us? And so the call to those who are faithful to those who are maturing or even are just starting out is to be diligent and faithful and intentional to run the race well. It's like being a part of a team. You get selected for the team. Maybe you get drafted for the team and that's like being placed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. But now it's up to us to hone the skills along with the coach that we're given, right? That's the Holy Spirit. And the power that he gives to us is different than the example I'm giving because he gives us so much more than any human coach can give us. But nevertheless, we are required by him to be on his team, citizens of his kingdom, which is in heaven. And as our Lord and Savior, from him we get our instructions, our example, and our direction. Thank you for joining us today on our YouTube channel, XL for Christ. We hope you like and even subscribe to our YouTube channel for ongoing edification that you can gain from listening to the messages and hopefully diving further into the Word of God to find out His truth. We also like you to visit our website at xlforchrist.org. This website talks about the discipleship process that we engage in with folks to help them grow in Christ. We hope you will join us in our endeavor to make disciples for the glory of God.